The Netherlands is a small country seen as utopia. Great infrastructure, unparalleled government graphic design, and an immense amount of economic and engineering power concentrated in a small, well-managed piece of land. But the Netherlands is not a perfect country. It's currently facing one of the worst housing crises in the world. Its governing parties aren't really trusted after falsely charging thousands of parents with abusing child benefits. A country that is expected to manage well, but manage corona just pretty badly. One that's known for being egalitarian, but is seeing increasing inequality. And it's a country that many feel lacks an adequate vision in a world that requires direction. Sure, it can compromise on some nice things, but it can act quickly on few. The Netherlands is not perfect. And fortunately for you, a random college student in a basement has managed to figure out exactly what's wrong with it. I have all the answers. See, the Dutch personality is a blend between priest and merchant, and also an angry old man. On the one hand, an undeniable feeling of original sin. The Dutch must avoid arrogance and vanity at all costs, where you risk the danger of standing out from the crowd. Normalcy is not boring, it's encouraged. On the other hand, you have the merchant, a deep pragmatism and efficient work ethic, little waste and a deep focus on function, with a frugality that produces thick wallets. Forget ordering in, mashed potatoes with carrots is more than sufficient. But between them is also that angry old man that voices their concerns, nitpicks and complains about everything in a bluntness that has become accepted because that's just, that's just you know how they are. No. And it's that blend of characters that helps us understand where the Netherlands' strengths begin, but where its biggest weaknesses lie. In the Gulders River area are two districts, Bommelerwaard and Overbetuwe. In the 16 and 1700s, both faced the risk of severe flooding. So they did what the Dutch do best, build dikes. But the two districts were not the same. Overbetuwe had larger farms and more extensive estates, was more unequal than Bommelerwaard, where a large portion of farmers worked smaller plots that they owned directly. In some Bommelerwaard villages, less than 40% of the land belonged to the nobility and institutions, but in Overbetuwe, it was more than 70. The two districts had different societies with different levels of inequality, but still, there was something that united them, a desire not to be killed by water. The Netherlands lies on the North Sea, where dangerous water is a fact of life. The land was first populated by the Fries, modern-day Frisians, called watermen by the Romans, who built their homes on Terpen, primitive mounds of easily manipulable clay and peat that would protect them from storm surges. But the water mud men were an innovative and restless bunch, Terpen combined, which made room for larger villages. They constructed smaller dikes to protect crops than entire seawalls, along with emergency dikes, Gooins, Sluisgates, and the one and only polder. The polder is one of the most recognizable features of the Netherlands. Build a wall around water and use a pumping system to pump water out. Dutch people manipulate water. It's a story most know. But what we forget is the reverse direction of the relationship. How water changed who the Dutch are themselves. Building dikes isn't easy but building the institutions that regulate that water management is harder. Dikes are the difference between life and death, and a single person cannot maintain a system of dikes on their own. So dikes gave birth to dike solidarity. Entire communities, be you rich or poor, farmer or urbanite, Protestant or Catholic, were tasked with relying on each other for dike maintenance. If the dike went down, you'd all drown. Communities established water boards where everyone could voice and deliberate about water management, and a culture of open discussion, nitpicking, and consensus had to develop. Farmers needed to know if their neighbors were holding up their side of the bargain, and if someone was an adventurous type who wanted to expand the land and change something about it, it'd be very possible that they could produce disastrous consequences for another. So consensus for large-scale decisions became even more important, not being normal, was a liability. And that brings us back to Bommelerwaard and Overbetuwe. They were different in their levels of inequality, but in the more unequal Overbetuwe, 
craftsmen who worked on the land sat on the same water board as those who owned the land they worked on. In Bumalervaert, nearly 50% of households held positions on the village council tasked with managing water at some point in their lives. And in Overbetua, it was the same. The looming danger of water gave room for political equality when economic inequality did not. Irrespective of property or social class, hundreds of years ago, the Dutch afforded large sections of its population a right to nitpick and endlessly discuss how water would be managed. The precursor for the Dutch system of pragmatic agreement and consensus that exists to this day. The Boulder Model, a system of consensus politics that is like no other on earth. Coalition governments are governments where a single party is not able to secure a majority of seats, and to pass legislation, they need to form a coalition with others to end up with a majority. After an election, the Dutch parliament, the Tweede Kamer, will appoint a verkenner that investigates potential combinations of parties that can form a coalition. When a potential combination is found, a new person, the informateur, will be appointed to guide the negotiations between those parties. The informateur, together with the coalition parties, will begin drafting a coalition agreement, which will then steer government policy for the years that that coalition is in power. Now, a similar process is practiced by others, sure, but Dutch coalition agreements are among the most elaborate. Not only are they able to secure some of the most precisely defined deals that exist, but the Dutch take coalition deals more seriously than most. This graph shows the time it takes to form a political coalition in Europe, and the Netherlands stands out on top. Now, you have Belgium sometimes, but Belgium is Belgium. But Dutch coalition times are not a good thing. An agreement in the end, sure, but it also reflects a system that isn't perfect, one where it has become even more difficult to form coalitions and produce policy, and one that isn't getting any better. The Netherlands used to be led by a big three, VVD, CDA, and PVDA, the merchant, priest, and old angry man, respectively. Although they were criticized for party dominance, the push and pull between all three provided stability for the coalition governments. A loss of one would be made up by the other two in the next. Although they still market each other as parasites, they're actually pretty codependent on each other. But the big three have declined, and in its place the number of parties has gone into overdrive. With 150 seats, the Tweede Kamer has 16 political parties. That's a lot for a small country. It's caused in part by the country being essentially one gigantic district with proportional voting. All 150 seats will be distributed across all the votes. But what makes the Dutch system uniquely prone to producing more parties is that it also has one of the lowest thresholds to enter parliament that exists, 0.67%, the equivalent of one seat, one of the purest examples of trying to give everyone a seat at the table. In Germany, if you don't get around 5% of the vote, you're not getting access to the Bundestag either. And these new smaller parties, although they may be derivative of another, still need to set themselves apart. You end up with parties like 50 Plus, a party for the elderly, and also a party for the animals, one of the first of its kind. Volt fragments the left liberal D66 because it gives Dutch university students with the personality of a root vegetable more character by letting them find all of their meaning in European integration. And altogether, the fragmentation of parties into smaller ones makes it more difficult to form coalitions, the consensus needed to guide the country. The Polder model is no longer an advantage, it's a penalty. This graph shows the number of parliamentarians relative to population, and stubborn country she is, the Netherlands likes to stand apart. It's a small country, but it has even smaller numbers of people to represent the population on the national level. A large party, although at risk of dominating and being boring, can breed specialization of members in the Tweede Kamer and better control the governing cabinet if they're in the opposition. It's not easy to have experts on financial, education, foreign, and green energy policy with only one or two people, unless they're YouTubers, of course, who are experts on everything. Add on the problem that there aren't enough support staff for parliamentarians to make up for the lack of members in the Tweede Kamer, and you end up with one of the largest issues for the Netherlands. No longer the dry, effective, pragmatic chamber it once was, it's instead seen a steep rise in motsies, literally just official political statements. 
Instead of experienced, dry consensus builders, you get politicians that fling easy, dramatic political rhetoric. Dutch parliamentarians spend more time signaling what they believe in, rather than getting laws passed that actually achieve it. A rise in empty marketing politics in a system that isn't built for it. Maybe it's an experience thing. Politicians just need time to gain more experience so they can produce effective legislation instead of crafting viral tweets. But instead, the Netherlands has seen a historic rise in politician turnover. Politicians leave the Tweede Kamer faster than they have before. So what you get is more parties, less experienced legislators, which means less experienced coalition builders, and then you hand them an especially thick set of problems that they need to solve, be it housing, corona, or an influx of refugees. But if it can't handle those problems, what you get is a historic rise in distrust. The strong consensus, pragmatic nature of the Netherlands works well when the priest, merchant, and angry old man work together, but it struggles when they compete for top of the heap. Too much of the old angry man led to a housing crisis. Constant critical nitpicking has a knack of being easier than actually building. And today, the Netherlands is blessed with one of the least elastic housing supplies that exists in the world. Too much of the priest meant a corona crisis where no person felt arrogant enough to take the lead, even when the speed of a decision was a question between life and death. And too much of the merchant meant that when Europe cried for fiscal solidarity, the Dutch just said, no. Like a cheese sandwich every day for lunch, another example of Dutch frugality taken to such an extreme that it's embarrassing. So a priest, merchant, and old man walk into a boulder, and they start to complain. The merchant says, we saved up a bunch of money by never cooking anything remotely delicious, so we can build something. We should probably build something. So the priest nervously replies, why? Why should I build something? You have to be pretty arrogant to suggest that you can build something. But then the old angry man interrupts because he feels like he's not being heard. Well, if something's going to be built, we better be in agreement and get it right because I don't want to build anything I don't agree with and I want to make sure that this tiny irrelevant detail is met before I start doing anything. And so, they begin to argue, as they have for hundreds of years. But what has made the Netherlands special is that if they can temper those differences in order to produce a result, that result can often be better than the three give credit to. Almost a year ago, I signed up for a streaming service to watch only one video, and that's this one, made by Neo. A single person behind a computer has produced one of the best videos I've seen on the attack. He covers an extremely sensitive political topic while staying close to reality. And there are literally only a handful of people on the entire internet who will explain current events by making 3D models like Neo does. And that video is only possible because along with hundreds of others, it's exclusively on Nebula, a streamy award-nominated, independently created streaming service that has no ads. And the best way to get access to Nebula is by signing up for the Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle for less than 15 a year. You don't just get Nebula, but CuriosityStream gives you access to thousands of new documentaries, like the one on the Rhine Mass Delta. If I didn't quench your thirst for polders, CuriosityStream surely will. If you want to help me make videos on Europe and other independent creators, the best way to do it is by signing up for the bundle at CuriosityStream.com. It's worth it. I always subscribe to both before I was even sponsored by them.